So in this module, we are going to talk about wires. And by wires, I mean interconnects that connect electronic devices and electronic gates, modules to each other within chips, and even chips to each other on a PCB. And so when we had a couple of inverters and the second inverter was lo loading the first one, this was all the external load we observed from the first inverter. We always considered these wires the ones that connect gates to each other, but also the wires that connect terminals of transistors to each other within the same gate, and even the wires that connect the gate to ground and supply lines, we consider them to be perfect and ideal. And by that, we mean that they had a resistance of zero and also a capacitance of zero. Wires do not have a resistance of zero and they absolutely do not have a capacitance of zero. And because they have both resistance and capacitance, they have an impact on delay. In fact, even if the wire can be uh, considered a perfect conductor, it still has a capacitance. And this capacitance is going to increase delay observed at gates. Normally, in older technologies, the uh, effect of wire delay was so insignificant that the majority of delay resided in gates. This is not true in modern technologies where wire delay is usually larger than gate delay. So let's just take a look at how wires look in um, an IC. And by wires, we usually mean metal wires that run in metal layers above the substrate. Uh, but we could also mean polysilicon wires or even wires made using the diffusion layer. But this view that we have here is representative only of metal wires and polysilicon wires because they are created above the substrate rather than within it. So as you can see, everything is floating within a um, sea of silicon dioxide. And silicon dioxide provides insulation for components from each other, as well as mechanical support for the wires. Now, the problem is that we have a conductive plate in the substrate and a conductive plate in each of these wires. Now, this means that there is a capacitance between the wire and the substrate. These wires are going to run for a very long distance. If you look at a layout, some of the local wires are going to, some of the global wires are going to run from one side of the ice of the chip to the other end. And therefore, they have a long, um, a very large area, a common area with the substrate. This is going to create a capacitance to the substrate and a capacitance to the well. The substrate and the well can be assumed to be connected to a signal ground. So this is in general a capacitance to ground. So first of all, these wires have a capacitance. Now for some of the uh, run of the wire, it's also going to intersect with the path of wires at different layers. This means that some of its capacitance is not entirely to the substrate, but is to wires and other layers. This is usually a small um, effect, and the majority of the capacitance of the wire can be considered to be to the substrate. We will see in a couple of videos that there is actually wire-to-wire -wire capacitance that can become very important, but this normally happens with wires in the same layer rather than interlayer wires. So let's take this wire, which is floating above the substrate in whatever layer it is, and let's just think about uh, its capacitance. So the capacitance here is a parallel plate capacitance, and the total wire capacitance can be written as epsilon oxide. This is the uh, permittivity of the intervening dielectric, which is silicon dioxide, multiplied by the uh, area of the plate. Now the plate is basically the wire itself, and its area is W, multiplied by L, so it's the bottom plate of the wire, so it's W multiplied by L, uh, divided by the distance between the two plates, which is the height of the wire above the substrate, which is T. This is the thickness of the oxide between the wire and the substrate. If we are talking about polysilicon, for example, uh, then this would be T oxide, which is defined by technology, but for other metal layers, it's also a thickness defined by technology. Notice that to a first order, we are assuming that TW, the height of the wire itself, has no effect or no impact on the value of capacitance. And this assumption is based entirely on the, on the, um, on the, uh, um, and this is based on the assumption that uh, the area of the plate, the dimensions of the plate W and L are much larger than its thickness TW. This was 
typically true for older technologies, but for reasons that will become clear shortly, it's not true for modern technologies. And so if we want to reduce the capacitance of the wire, and why would we want to reduce the capacitance of the wire? And the answer is always because we want to reduce capacitive loading on the gate driving the wire, thus reducing the total external capacitance or external load that the gate is driving. So if we want to re reduce wire capacitance, we can reduce epsilon oxide or reduce W, reduce L or increase T. Now let's take each of these uh, and see how uh, practical they are. Reducing W means that we are reducing the width of the wire. Normally metal wires used for routing are going to be as narrow as, as the design rules allow. And therefore there is a floor that you hit real soon when scaling down wires, uh, when reducing the width of wires, which is determined by DRC. Beyond that, you cannot make the wires any thinner. Uh, but also notice that th this will have an impact on the resistance of the wire, which we still haven't discussed yet. So this doesn't come without a cost. Reducing L is actually a very good uh, way to reduce capacitance because reducing the length of the wire not only reduces capacitance, but also reduces resistance, and therefore it reduces the total time constant of the wire. On the other hand, the length of the wire is determined by placement and routing. The place and route tool will make the best effort to place and route gates so that it reduces the amount of interconnect delay between them and achieve closure. This means that you usually don't have much space to move in reduction of L. Now, T is an interesting variable here. T is the height of the wire above the substrate. And in fact, this is um, very interesting because in, at first it seems like we can reduce capacitance by increasing T and we will not pay anything in return. And this might seem true, especially for metal wires. I mean, you can't use the same sense for polysilicon because polysilicon needs to be relatively close to the substrate so that transistor gates have electrostatic control over the channel, but for metal wires, there, there really doesn't seem to be anything stopping us. But this is not true. There are technological challenges in uh, raising the wire above the substrate. So if you have a metal wire that is relatively close to the substrate or to the layer just be below it, recall that wires need to connect to layers below and above them through contacts or vias. And so there will be a via down here. But if, it, if we have a metal layer at a higher uh, altitude and it needs a via, the via is going to be much longer than this. Now think about the kind of etching you will need to open this via down all the way down to the substrate and the kind of etching you will need here. So you'll need to etch longer for the uh, higher, for the high altitude wire for uh, the via to open all the way down, which, which is going to mean more lateral etching which is going to reduce the, uh, the density of wires and it's going to reduce the density of wires as well. But one more thing here is that the longer the wires, uh, the longer we have a path that current has to pass through on its way down. This path is usually very narrow because wires are as narrow as possible to promote density, which means that current density through the wire is going to be large. Now, this is going to create uh, a phenomenon called electromigration. And electromigration is a phenomenon where the continuous flow of a high current density over time leads to deterioration in the metal of the, uh, in, in the wire. This deterioration happens because atoms from the wire are going to migrate with the current, thus increasing the resistance of the contact with uh, continued use. And so wires that are at a higher latitude that need longer wires are going to suffer from electromigration more. And this is a huge reliability issue which can lead to failure over time. So increasing T is a viable option, but it, it isn't without its uh, cost. Now, we only have permittivity remaining here, and this is actually very interesting. So permittivity, we can't say the permittivity of silicon dioxide. Uh, or epsilon oxide, it's actually epsilon, the permittivity of whatever material is between the wire and the substrate. And so you can see here that if you use uh, materials with lower permittivity, you can actually achieve lower, um, lower uh, 
uh, capacitance for the wire, right? So let's just look at what options we have. So this is the relative permittivity of materials, of course, relative to the permittivity of vacuum. And we can see that the best we can achieve is vacuum. So if we separate the wire from the substrate using vacuum or air, that's the best we can do. But of course, that doesn't provide um, mechanical support for the wires, right? Silicon dioxide has a relative permittivity of approximately four, which is not actually too bad if you compare it to uh, something like silicon, but there are other dielectrics, especially um, hydrocarbon dielectrics or plastic dielectrics that have a lower uh, relative permittivity, some even close to two. And so this is an interesting choice here because it can reduce the capacitance of wires by two, twofold, just by using a different uh, a different dielectric. And that, you know, again, has no apparent cost. But again, the cost of using a low permittivity dielectric is technological, mainly, because silicon dioxide is a great insulator to work for, work with, uh, not just because it is the native oxide of, of silicon, that is no longer really a concern because we usually deposit silicon dioxide, but because it has great thermal and uh, electrical and mechanical properties that none of these plastics have. So this is again a, an interesting idea, but it really just, it's not that practical. Now, if you look at the uh, equation of capacitance again, C wire, wire capacitance is equal to epsilon oxide, W times L over T. And if you want to separate technology dependent versus the design dependent parts of the wire capacitance, we can say that epsilon oxide by T is the wire capacitance per unit area, and we will call this C wire per unit area. And all you have to do is multiply it by the area of the wire, and you get the total capacitance. You can also be given uh, wire capacitance per unit length. So in that case, the technology depend dependent part will be epsilon oxide W over T, and you just have to multiply that by the length of the wire to get total uh, capacitance. And so this would be CL times L, and CL will be in uh, microfarad per, per micrometer, for example. So why would we fold in uh, width with uh, technology defined parameters? Because in some cases, some designers will always use wires with minimum width, uh, this, that is the width that is dictated by DRC, and will just leave length as an open parameter. Sometimes not, but in, in most cases, yes, you do reduce the width of the wire as much as possible in order to reduce, not only reduce its capacitance, but also to increase the packing density of wires, which actually opens up a good uh, chance for finding closure for the place, place and route tool, which in return would reduce the average length of wires in, in, in the circuit, which has a great impact on not only capacitance, but also resistance, and thus on the total delay of wires.